Mr. Hamish Miller. Thank you. Now, they said I might have some trouble with my beard. Would you tell me if it's scratching on the microphone? Tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. Nā mihi koto takoa. Nā mai, nā mai, hairi mai, tēnā koto katoa. That's a very warm welcome from our Māori, Māori friends. And it's a welcome to everybody, their body, mind and spirit, to this meeting and their journey today, and not only today, but their journey through the life to bring you to this weekend where we hope we'll learn from each other. And it comes with a humble apology to any of the New Zealanders here who speak Māori. <laughs> <laughs> because it is not an easy language to speak. Now, I want to talk this afternoon about um, our human perceptions. And we were drawn to New Zealand to investigate the... Earth energy there, because it seems to be much more dynamic, it, must, it seems to move faster, it's stronger, it's pulsing, it's young, it's only 450 million years old, and it's really worth investigating. And on the second visit, we came across a, a piece of wisdom that, um, from one of the Maori elders, and it is actually so relevant to the work that we do, and many of us do, that I really must read it to you. He said, we are currently returning to a period of discovery of a psychic science relating to the harnessing of earth energies. Some vestiges of this science have been preserved in many parts of the world by a few of the so-called primitive races, who still utilize the power emanating from sacred sites which have lain partially dormant for many generations. The ancients mastered to a very high level a sophisticated psychic science harnessing the earth's elemental forces together with the command of psychic power far beyond anything we can at this stage even begin to comprehend. And he ends by saying many things are being revealed to us only in small fragments lest we be unable to cope or understand what is to come. And that's an extraordinary piece of wisdom. It's an example of, of advanced thinking that's occasionally revealed by some of the Māori some of the ancestors. Now, most of us have had our perceptions limited, probably for the best reasons in the world, by a long line of parents and teachers and clerics and politicians and military strategists and, and a plethora of experts who all know what's good for us. They do tend, however, to, to create mindsets which make no allowance for lateral thinking. And we need new solutions to our increasing problems in the world, in our relationships with the earth and our relationships with each other. And these problems have got to come from some way beyond the five senses. Now, for me, one of the easiest ways is that many of us are going to be talking about the extra five senses and coming from different directions. But we're, all, we're all going the same way and heading for the same target. One of the easiest ways to reach the gateway to beyond the five senses, for me, was through dowsing. Because you are actually using a sense which is beyond. You're, you're actually finding things that you can't discern from, with your ordinary five senses. So you're moving into an area of sixth sense. But I won't go in today through dowsing because that's not what it's all about. All I can say is that there is the most magnificent little book called The Definitive Wee Book on Dowsing in the thing out there. <laughs> Very cheap. Does the whole game for you. So have a look for it afterwards. Now, I have an interesting little tool um, to illustrate how we must be willing to think again about the most simple things in order to break out from our locked-in perceptions. I'm going to play a CD of uh, my tame team of crickets. Now, some of you may have heard this before, but don't worry about it. I've heard it a thousand times, and I find it deeply moving. The crickets were chirping away as crickets do, to each other. But their life cycle is very short and very frenetic. 
And I had a word with them and said, do you think you could sing? We'd love to know what you're, what you're saying to each other. But we can't really take it in because our life, life cycle is much longer and perhaps we're thicker. But we, we can't really understand what you're saying to each other. So uh, would you mind going away and slowing down your rate of singing so that it coincides with our lifestyle, life span, uh, as opposed to yours? So they went off and they had a bit of practice and they came back and said, it doesn't sound at all bad. And we're quite happy to make a recording of it, provided we get a little kickback for every time you play it. So this sound, I must emphasise, is totally from crickets. There were one or two aged ones with grey beards that wouldn't comply, and they kept chirping away to each other as they all normally do, but most of them agreed to modify their singing so that it would be good for us. Now, this sound is purely from crickets. I must emphasise there is no human input, there is no musical instrument, there is nothing but crickets singing to each other. things happening in the world all around us that we're not aware of because we're not tuned into them. Can you imagine the thousands of other things that must be happening that we're not aware of? Beautiful things that would be make fundamental differences to, to our quality of life. Can you imagine what the sound of deep red velvet roses make when they talk to each other? We're getting into work that Mary was doing this morning. We're all going the same way. We're getting into other senses. We're appreciating that, that our five are terribly restricting. And we've got to do something about it. There are also very special things happening in the field of earth energy. And I would like you to take, to, take you on a, excuse me, a very fast track through the beginnings of the thing that led to the New Zealand investigation. Bear with me if you've seen some of this before. But it's an essential lesson on, on the simple things that happen that develop into something much more complex. And we must be aware of things outside the normal interpretation of events. Now, I hope we can start the slides. Ah! Now, it all happened uh, with the Son of the Serpent. Won't go into Son of the Serpent. You all know the story. Probably all know the story. And if you don't, there's another book outside there. <laughs> But um, having done 18 months of the following the Michael line and getting to Avebury and discovering that uh, there was not only the Michael, there was the Mary. And this is another reason why I, was, I thought the Maori thing was very important. If I had been fed the information about the two lines all at the same time, I'd never got out of Cornwall. So they're actually feeding in information in, in small quantities so that we can begin to understand. So... At the end of the time, I came back and, and we had found the, the weaving lines, we had found the nodes, we knew that the nodes were important, and I sat down at Carnley Ball on the flat slab at the back of that standing stone there, and I said, what do I do with this? Just how important is it? And then I heard this, this voice saying, and, and I, I, I talk about the management, they're great guys, and they've got a huge sense of humour, and they're very patient with me. And they said, why don't you just ask if there's any other manifestations? Because it had the usual manifestations of, of spiral and, and uh, radials coming out. 
Why don't you ask, is this another energy manifestation? So I did, and an hour later I found the manifestation was this incredible distorted pentagram. Old story, the development of that right through the Michael line. I went to the next node point to find out if I could find the same thing, and I did. Uh, right the way up to, through Michael's mind, to various sites, and I kept coming back to Carnival Ball and saying, is this, is this the same? And yes, it was the same manifestation that had been crossing. And I thought, this is going to be easy. I'm going to go right up there, and, and, and that's, that's what it is. When I got to Boramump, there was the first change, and I thought, whoops, we're going to have a a problem here. The distorted pentagram is still there, but it's not quite so distorted. So I thought, and I went back to Carnley Ball, and that information had been fed back down the line. This implied some sort of communication down these two energy lines, uh, 50, 100 miles. So going on from there to, the, to Glastonbury <laughs> and the crossing there, now, there may have been changes in between because this was a time we were broke and we had to come up just for odd, odd days and things. But when we got here, we found the manifestation at the crossing points had changed to a perfect symmetric ten-pointed star. And this is not my imagination because the, the subsequent work proves that, that, that this is actually happening. So by the time we got to the mighty Avebury, she had changed to a twelve-pointed star symmetrically perfect 12-pointed star. You do it quite easily by dowsing. You just ask the dowsing rod to show you where it, where it is and follow it, put thread down and then measure it. Uh, it's a very simple process. By the time we got to the end of the line, the Sun and the Serpent, at Hopton, it had thrown another three 12-pointed stars on the outside. Now, patently, this was pulling me on to try and discover something which I didn't realise just how important it was, and I still don't know, to be honest. Uh, but this stayed like this for ten years. and No, nine years. And nine years later, I went back to St Michael's Mount, and I had time to do something, and she had inserted a little 12-pointed star right in the middle. Now, as far as I know, this is still going, and there's, there's a ten-year cycle now between these times. So it actually took ten years to develop from this distorted pentagram to this sophisticated four-way 12-pointed star. Now, when we went to, uh, to do the, Michael and, uh, the Apollo and Athena line down through Europe, we were forewarned that something was going to happen. So we went up, we started at, at uh, uh, Michael Skelly. And we said, now, OK, we found a crossing here of the, of the Apollo and Athena. What does it look like? And it said... Uh, it was in the place. That's just an astonishing place. You must go there sometime. It's, it's amazing. And the manifestation where the lines crossed was a very simple quadrophile function. And I said, OK, we're going to do a 10,000-mile journey, and this is going to change on the way down. What is it going to change into? And Gaia said, I'm sorry. I'm not going to tell you. You have got to go down this line. You've got to be influenced by all these energies, and something will happen. So... You don't argue with Gaia. You know, she's, a, she's a tough lady. The next change on this thing was halfway through France. It stayed that way until we got to Bourges Cathedral. And then you got that little ripple. It's, it's a trefoil, it's a clover leaf, it's whatever you describe. But it was a change in the manifestation. And the next one is done in Italy. Um, just over the, the border into the valley in Italy at uh, Michele. St. Michele. Uh, St. Michael, obviously, up the top. And you, as usual, the, the, the crossing was not in the obvious place there. It was down on the, on the little uh, sepulchre. They call it a sepulchre here. And that actually was uh, built on an even more ancient site. And the manifestation had changed again. So you've got four times three, you get a 12 factor coming in again. 12 pointed stars, 12 pointed, 12, 12 keeps, keeps coming in for some reason. And I felt that, that uh, they were being very patient. And, and they realized that, that with our five senses, we are very simple creatures. And they can't push us. They can't push the river. They, they, we just go at our own pace. Strangely enough, we went into the, the uh, cathedral in, in Genoa 
And on the floor of the cathedral, we found, for some reason, that some master craftsman had carved into the marble a distorted pentagram. And in fact, that one there is almost identical to the... I hadn't noticed this before, actually. It's almost identical to the shape we had at Barra Mump. And why did this master craftsman carve that distorted pentagram there? I don't know. Pure coincidence, probably. The next one was at uh, Gargano. This is the, the heel that sticks out of Italy. Monte Gargano. And an underground church, 150 feet underground. And as we went down the stairs on there, we, we heard these celestial sounds. And I thought this was a, some celestial choir they'd brought in for the tourists or something. When we got to the bottom, there were about 15 Italians just singing. And of course, the echoes were re echoing and re echoing, and, and it, was, it was just so numinous down there. It was just, just unbelievable. And right in the center here was a, was a crossing. And I hadn't uh, the temerity actually to, to douse it there because my dowsing rods are quite big. And you can do this. When you, we can refer to the crossing point, you can take the manifestation out to somewhere else and do it discreetly somewhere else. So we went up out of the cave. And the manifestation had thrown another leaf out. Now, this is a similar process to the other one, but a completely different manifestation. And the final one, uh, we went down, down through Athens. There's a long story about that, which I, I can't tell you because I'm terribly restricted on time here. I've tried to crush five years into 40 minutes, and this is not easy. Um, beyond there is the Temple of Minerva in Corfu. Looks an absolute wreck. It, 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 it was an absolutely magnificent temple. I think the old people knew something because we, we saw that the architrave here is, is something like 80 feet wide, beautifully carved, with the Medusa in the center with her serpent hair and the twining serpents around her waist. Now, I think they knew that the, the, these twining serpents had come down through the whole of Europe and met at the temple of Minerva, and they threw out the third manifestation. Now, the man manifestation stayed, but it took us 10 years to do that journey. So the changes were spaced over a period of 10 years. And we decided that, that you know, this is, this is not on, because I'm, I'm getting so old, I haven't got another 10 years to do any more work. I must find a place in the world where the energy moves faster. And New Zealand eventually uh, was the place. However... We didn't want to sort of dash out there and miss anything important. So that was Mokhraka, where the final, final crossing was. Uh, the manifestation didn't change there. And that one is uh, Megiddo, which is the most peaceful place in the world, actually, as far as energy is concerned, which seems to me to be uh, odd because its name is Armageddon. And that is Armageddon, and it is beautifully balanced peace there. I know there's fringe stuff going around there, but that's, that's, that's going to sort out, I'm quite sure. The battle, the battle has been won, and it's, it's peripheral stuff that's, that's happening now. So, Excuse me, where is it? Megiddo, in uh, Israel. Israel. Palestine. Palestine, big part. yes, both. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're quite right. I'm not getting into that argument right now. Uh, we decided that, that perhaps the Southern Hemisphere had more to offer, and we had an opportunity to go down to Buenos Aires. And the, the energy there is so exciting. But they are, they, at the time we were there, they were absolutely flat broke, but people still leapt up and danced in cafes and things like that. Wonderful energy. But not that we could pin down as uh, the sort of place that we could do a lot of investigation. So we went up to, to Rio de Janeiro, because I'd always wanted to see this great Jesus figure, because I thought that must be on an incredibly powerful sacred site, a power center like nothing else in the business. And we finally got up there, and it was a good two or three hours before I dared douse it. And finally, I discovered there was a chapel underneath this, this Jesus figure. And I went into the chapel, and there was no more energy in that chapel than uh, in a normal little village church. And I suddenly realized that I think that this huge figure was put there more as a tourist attraction than an acknowledgement of sacred place, because sacred place is where masses of lines cross. And in fact, you can stand at that Jesus figure and ask for the most powerful energy center within, the, within a mile, 
and find it on the top of a hill just to the north. Now, if they put that figure on the top of that hill, it would have been absolutely astonishing, I think, the effect. It's a fine piece of sculpture. It's, it's there for very good reasons, I'm sure, but it hasn't affected the, the energy around Rio de Janeiro. The next stop was um, Table Mountain, Cape Town. And we had a very interesting three days there where we, we did a lot of work, Bar and I, and we found two very major lines coming in across the sea and coming and crossing on the top of Table Mountain. There was a, uh, a television company that was quite interested in, in, in what we were doing. They did a, a 3D shoot, in fact, and within, I think it was 10 days, they had the programme out, and they had a terrific amount of interest from it. Um, and when the lines came in, I don't know if you can see on that thing, but the, the Cape Town is down here, and these two lines came in. That's Table Mountain up there with the cable car and the sea on the other side around here. And these lines came together up here uh, at a place that we found later was called Union Cave, strangely enough. We have funny coincidences happening all over the place. Now, the manifestation at the top of where these lines came together was extremely sophisticated. It's either four landscapes or it's an eight-petaled thing. Now, I must bring in this guy called uh, Bernoulli, who, who in 1742 was a physicist and mathematician. And he did a lot of calculations on interference patterns between uh, the, the spiral vortex energy, uh, Fibonacci spiral energy, and interference uh, energy coming in. Worked out the mathematics of it, and his logical mathematics said you'd get petal forms and all sorts of things like that. So the physicists are accepting that this exists now. And, uh, but we thought it was just, just beautiful. This takes us, uh, again, South Africa was, was, oh, I must say that, that during that time, we, we, after the three days, we went to uh, meet a man called Credo Mutwa. A lot of you have met him, have heard of him. He's one of the spiritual leaders of the Zulus. And we had two days uh, with him, actually, and we listened to him for the first day because he, he, he's just an incredible man with a 100% with recall of everything he's ever done. And... Um, at the end of the day, he said, have you got any questions? And I said, well, with great temerity, I said, Bar and I have found a couple of massive energy lines coming in from the sea and crossing at the top of Table Mountain. And he stood up and he said, I think, uh, I think the session is now finished. And he just stopped out. And I thought I'd done something terrible. And he came in the next morning, and we were in great trepidation. There was 10 of us the day before. There was only three of us on the second day, and he came in with great dignity, an immense presence, and he sat down, and he looked at the two of us, and he suddenly grinned from ear to ear, and he said, the two lines, their names are Shango and Mao. Shango is the, the Zulu name for Hercules, and Mao is the Earth Mother, and I have done a little map for you, and he unfolded a map, and he said, these lines come together at Cape Town, and they go to that sacred site, and that one, and that one, and that one, up to Egypt. And suddenly we realised that 20 years of work that we've been following, our urge to find out something about these earth lines, these people knew all about. The ancients knew all about them, and they used them. And we were just so encouraged that we thought, we must find out more about this. So the next lot was New Zealand. That is Monganui Bluff. And we were drawn there, North Island, New Zealand. We were drawn there because of the name, actually, because the Maori name is the gathering place of all the great stars. And that, for an evocative name, can you beat it? I mean, it's just we had to, to, to go there. Very excited. And we were taken there by Gary Cook, who should actually be doing this talk. And uh, I'll never forgive him. <laughs> And we, he took us on his, his four-wheel drive to get to Monganoo Bluff, and we drove for 27 kilometres along the sand. And you've got to get the time right, because um, if, if the tide comes in, it wipes out the vehicle, or it sinks, or you can't get it out. But it's, it's the most surreal drive. You, you have a great crashing sea on one side, and, and flat sand, and nothing. No vehicles, nothing. And we got on to the, the, the bluff there, and we prepared to do to douse and find out what the energy was like. That's what we found. That was the manifestation on this magical place. And Bar said, 
we have come 13,000 miles to find an old dog bone. <laughs> and I could deny it, because when you're doing this stuff, you have got, you've got to be honest. You've got to record exactly what you find. Otherwise, it's a nonsense, and, and something else happens. So we, we uh, Julie put it down and uh, drew it up and, and slightly disheartened went to uh, One Tree Hill, which is no longer got a tree because um, it wasn't an indigenous tree and somebody knocked or helped the Scots pine to fall and then they found that an indigenous tree wouldn't grow there. So for 20 years, I think it is, they haven't decided what tree is going to replace it. So it's One Tree Hill with no tree but it's an old volcano with, with, a, with a tremendously active energy centre. And we doused it again, and we got another dog bone. Now, we had some conjecture about the size of the animal that buried the dog bone, or the size of the dog that produced the bone. And, we had to, and then we thought that there might be some connection between Monganui and Bluff, but it wasn't exactly a connection. So we went further to a site called Temple of the Four Winds, which unfortunately was torched... Uh, by someone about 20 years ago. But this was a building which is, is uh, in, on an incredibly sacred site. And it's, uh, it has eight energy lines coming into the centre. And it was built with a full knowledge of sacred geometry and all sorts of things. And some of the measurements and the angles and things like that um, are, are quite, quite astonishing. And a, a, a terrific record of it. It's one of the few buildings in... New Zealand, they, they actually did a lot of measurement before. They, and the, the alignments to planets and all sorts of things are hugely important. Now, this is one of the places that... Um, and this is why... One of the reasons, possibly, why the energy down in New Zealand is, is stronger than the energy here. And that is that the ancient Waitaha tied up all these sacred sites to the Southern Cross. They tied the, the, the land to the stars. That's the legend. What they were aware of, that we have a cosmic part of our being, and they were acknowledging it, and they, tied the, they put these stones in various parts of New Zealand, all the way down to Antarctica, and every time they tied them to the stars, they tied them to the cosmos, they had that sort of knowledge. And this is what we were delving into and getting ourselves into very slowly. That's all that's left of it uh, now, but the manifestation in the centre... The first year was, you can see the eight energy lines coming in and the landscape. The landscape appears, a single landscape, the first one we found in New Zealand. We thought, we're getting somewhere. We've got a correlation between Table Mountain, at least, and, and here. But the, the year following, I can't do this in sequence because I just haven't got time. The following year, we went there again and the manifestation had changed. And I'm sorry, that slides the wrong way around, but it's exactly the same thing. It's now, or it was, 12 touching circles, a fundamental change in 12 months. So the energy changes are so much faster there. Back to the fact of 12. Down in South Island, we found we, we stayed with um, uh, a family, an apple farmer actually, Greg Wood, and he said, there is a stone that I've been looking at for 18 years. And we, uh, we haven't been able to get to it because in, there's no right of, of passage in New Zealand. You have to get farmers' permission to, to go to on the land, even for a walk. But he did get all the, the uh, permissions together. And um, he took us up there. There's 12 of us went up there. And this, to me, was patently a standing stone. We had all sorts of sensitives with us. We were dowsing for the age of whether it was put there by humans, and there was a consensus that this thing was put on the top of this hillock because it's a stone. Uh, it's overgrown now, but it's, it's a stone, artificial stone hill with this amazing stone on top of it. And that to me, was a standing stone. There's no, absolutely no question. It's, it's, it's been put there by humans, and the timing you know, is, is infinitely, thousands of years before the Maori ever appeared. That is a photograph of Greg standing by the stone to give you an idea of his height. He's about a six-foot man, and he was messing about, as he does. He's a wonderful fellow. I love the New Zealanders. They've just got a wonderful sense of, of, of closeness to the earth. He was messing about, and his wife was taking the shots. Rose took the shot. She said, don't mess about. Stand properly. 
And he stood properly, and she managed to get a photograph of the energy coming off the stones. Now, we, we saw that with David's stuff this morning. Energy coming out. This is not black energy. This is how it reflected on the camera. I have tried to take these photographs, but actually, if you try, you can't do it. It depends on your, your connection with the, the energy. It's, it's a relaxed... You must totally relax and not try and do it. When you don't try and do it, you can get it. So a lot of you probably have photographs like that. If you have, don't throw them away as faulty. Send them to me. <laughs> I'm making a collection of them. I've got a huge collection now. And this is, you can almost see the spiral uh, of, of that energy coming through the stone. It's hugely, hugely powerful. And not recorded. There is no note of it anywhere in, in, in the history of, of New Zealand. And the manifestation around it, the first year we did it, there was no manifestation at all. There were five lines coming into it, no manifestation. The second year, it had that extraordinary manifestation, almost a humanoid form. It was perfect, there were five, and they touched each other on their arms, if you like. I didn't know that until I'd done all the measurements and, and came back and drew it out. And that manifestation actually always has something to do with either... The, the New Zealand energy, or the, the Punamu, the, the uh, peace stone, the, the, uh, the magical stone that the, the, the old Waitaha were looking for, the peace stone. Now, that developed, and this was quite extraordinary, the following year, and I'm talking about these very, very fast movements of, of, of energy and manifestation. It's as if the Earth is actually recognising that, uh, and it responds to our consciousness, it's recognising that it's now urgent the year 2012 we've talked about, it's urgent that we move on from where we are to an interpretation that, that in, allows us to think about the Earth as a being and part of the, the, the cosmic uh, crowd that we are. We're not in isolation, we're not in control. And the other the year manifestation, the year afterwards, was that. Now that, to me, was absolutely incredible. I almost cried when I, I, I drew this out. The ages to those, it... But it's so much like a snowflake. It is so much like um, the, the forms in water, the crystalline forms in water that the Japanese doctor is, is finding. You've probably all seen these. Pure water looks like that in an elegant crystalline form. Down to South Island and uh, Castle Hill. Now, Castle Hill is the Glastonbury, if you like, of, of, uh, of New Zealand. It is the most extraordinary place. These are limestone rocks, and they are gigantic. And it's, it's a site of a, a school of, of um, learning of the ancient Waitaha, the tribe that were there before the, the, the Maori. South Island, middle of South Island, about 100 miles east of um, Christchurch. That's, the, that's the, the site, and on the top of that site, you'll just see these, you'll see some of these in, in detail before. Nothing happens. Don't I'm pointing it the wrong way. Wow. <laughs> You've got five minutes, by the way. Oh, sorry. To... I haven't started yet. <laughs> Never mind. Never mind. These, these are the, the, the stones on the top. This is the University of Learning, the top University of Learning in, in the old part of New Zealand. Up there. That big one there is Marotini, the female who looks after the whole site. Now, I've got to chop, a bit, chop bits out of here because this is all terribly important. That's the sort of limestone rocks that make the whole place. That's the marae where everything started to happen. I doused this marae and there were five lines coming in and there was absolutely no manifestation. This Maori girl came in and did a ceremony and sang to the earth. She included Ba and four other women. And the following morning I went to the site and I got that, which is a development of the dog bone. Um, I went back to Castle Hill, not Castle Hill, One Tree Hill and got that manifestation there, which was very similar. So there were beginning to be some sort of tie-up. I went back to Monganui Bluff, and he got this sort of manifestation, which was like a propeller. Now, very briefly, we had to go back home. 
And we arranged to go back the next year. And I um, made all sorts of arrangements to do talks with Barry and, and Barry uh, Brailsford and Gary Cook. And when we got to Australia, I, got, I was bitten by something. I was uh, hospitalised. I was hallucinating. I had temperatures of 104. I was hallucinating every evening. And um, I had to cancel all the talks and things like that. And the hallucination for four uh, consecutive nights was that I was the hospital changed into a laboratory with big glass tanks with different colours in, and very benign people were squirting nutrients into these amoeba-type creatures, and I was one of them. I was not the least bit afraid because at the back of me there were two immense beings who were guarding me, and I got to know them. I didn't see them, but I got to know them in my head so well because they were chuntering to each other. They were huge, and they had big, deep voices. And they kept saying, it's all very well looking after this, this creature, but he's made of very poor material. <laughs> and so I did a sketch of them, a very quick sketch of them, because they got so familiar after four nights. And uh, we, we came back. Anyway, we, we, st we got back and into work again. Went up to the north of North Island, and this uh, Spirits Bay, there was a great, two great lines coming in, and we doused the energy and I had to pull it away because I couldn't walk to it. And we got that manifestation, and a chap called Cornelius van Dorp, a doctor, was with us, and he said, I have a collection of crop circle things, and we'll go on the computer, and he found very quickly that photograph, which Blitzer Lucy Pringle allowed me to have and show you. And can you see the, the similarity? It's even got the, the one thick spoke on it. So we're getting manifestations which are reflecting the manifestations of crop circles in ordinary earth energy centres. That, to me, was quite extraordinary. Out on the... Uh, this is the Cap Reinga on the top. We found the, first, the only line in the world where all the energy goes one way. And I went rushing back to Barry Brailsford and said, why is this? And he said, the legend of the White Art is that all the souls who die in New Zealand go right through all these, these stone-marked um, places and finally go out there to their own Valhalla. That's North Island, right at the North Island. Manganui Bluff. I've got, to, I've got to go quickly now because he won't give me any more time. <laughs> Manganui Bluff had, had changed to that very, very complex manifestation by now. And I think about it. These changes are, are, are so fast. And they're, they're doing it ten times faster than the Northern Hemisphere. One Tree Hill suddenly had the cog with one almost missing. Its next one, on March 2005, was that, that shape there. Now, it's telling us something. I don't know what it is. Went back to Castle Hill, found that that was the manifestation now. And at that point, I said, what is the point of me going on? I, I, I am dozing, and I'm finding intelligence-led changes in the manifestation. And I don't know what to do with them. I don't know what they're about. And there was a, a lady called Pat Ango, who's a very sensitive lady, and she happened to be with us. And she suddenly said, look, I've never done this before. I've got to, I've got to sit in this centre. There's a message for you. And there was the message for the ancestors. And very briefly, it was, they said, tell the male that uh, he is not qualified to interpret what is happening. His job is to record these things, and a, and a female will come along and interpret what they are. Now, that really did cut me down to size, because they said... <laughs> they did. They, they, he, they said... There are seven levels of understanding here, and the male is not even ready for the second level. <laughs> so I, uh, I was disturbed at first, and then I realized, of course, this is right, because if I had a, I tried to interpret them, I would have bent what I was finding to go on the wrong path. And they, they were the wise ones. Anyway, that happened. Uh, from that beautiful manifestation, a week later, um, this happened. Beautiful manifestation again. That's Maratini. That's her again, but very big. We'd only be half an inch high here. That's the manifestation that went around Mar Maratini. That's Rahai Putu. That's the great head with the manifestation around it, which is like that, that the first, one of the crop, first uh, crop circles that uh, was talked about this morning. That is the numinous place where I had the final contact with the, uh, the ancestors. 
Long, long story. I'm just going to read very quickly. It will only take a couple of minutes. Uh, they, they came through very loud and clear. Incidentally, these were the rocks behind me. That was the sketch I made in the hospital. These were the guys. That was the proportion of it. They were absolutely immense, and they were these stone people who were talking to each other. Absolutely extraordinary. So they were in, in, uh, the, the ancestors came through, and I'm going to simplify their message to it very quickly. They were deeply concerned about who was choosing our leaders. In their time, time Peter, uh, leaders were born to the position with deep compassion and profound wisdom from their ancestors. They have the impression that ours are bought and sold by a few people who, in my vernacular, have cornered the money supply. They had no need to surround themselves with armies of legal people who endlessly argue fine points of law instead of seeking out the truth. Their wisdom was sufficient, was sufficient to make them capable of making compassionate and fair decisions for everybody. Their medicine men treated mind, body and spirit as an integral part of human existence. Natural drugs were used, but were not any part of the commercial exchange. They only took from the earth what they needed and they wasted nothing. The greed and selfishness of a few have led the society which now uses earth resources to an unsustainable level and which will very quickly lead to the disintegration of its delicate structure. They ask that the decision makers must be made aware of their blindness is leading to chaos. They realise that the communications world is also owned with the same black agenda and it's difficult for most people to make themselves heard in this environment. However... They said, there is still an ancient talent still used by the supposed primitive people, i.e. the Kogi and the Aborigine and the Maori, which we can all relearn, and I emphasise relearn, and which would be the most powerful weapon to redress the balance. That is communication between each other without words. It will be necessary to become more open and honest than we have been for generations, but we could develop a society with incalculable benefits of a simple, basic trust in each other. It's happening already. We make three, three people in, in New Zealand who actually do that within families. I will have a lot more to say, but I haven't any more time to say it. <laughs> Mr. Hamish Miller, thank you very, very much. Thank you.